So, uh, welcome back, everybody. And we continue with the much, much expected contribution by Ben Selwyn. Thanks, ben, Frank. go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Marcel and Joost and uh, all for organizing this. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I've got 20 minutes. Um, what a shame I couldn't be with you guys. Uh, it's much nicer to be there in company. But uh, what with the quarantine, I couldn't afford to uh, be at home for two weeks. Um, <clears throat> so, so this paper is on um, super, super exploitation in the global north and the imperial mode of living. Uh, some thoughts. And um, I have to say, like I wrote in the top of the paper, I wrote this um, before the summer. So I wrote it under conditions of lockdown, homeschooling, homeworking, which uh, are definitely not ideal. And they really bring home to you the, um, the privileges uh, many of us have of um, not having to deal with uh, care work uh, every minute of the day. I mean, the minute we do, suddenly a half an hour lunch break becomes a two hour lunch break and suddenly your productivity collapses. Um, so there are lots of issues in the uh, paper that are kind of not uh, very well thought through. And there are issues there that I mean, I, I hold my hands up and say, you know, I, I, I haven't done the research properly on some of these things like, for example, what Marini said about uh, super exploitation in the global north, uh, gendering issues of super exploitation. So um, I, I admit this is an exploratory paper. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so the key thesis of the imperial mode of living um, argument, as I understand it, is, or for me at least, is that northern workers do or may or think they benefit from um, exploitation um, of workers in the global south. And, uh, and this, as Marcel points out, is often the case through, uh, you know, really cheap goods being provided. So, I mean, you know, John's done a brilliant job in his book on um, imperialism, showing how coffee, t-shirts, you know, technology uh, is unbelievably cheap. Uh, we can buy these things, uh, workers can buy these things so cheap compared to, say, 30 years ago. I mean, you can buy a t-shirt now for two or three pounds. 30 years ago, I remember, you know, you'd be spending a lot more. Um, so, uh, the super exploitation concept is key. Um, and as I point out uh, in the paper, I think there are two concepts of super exploitation. One is the kind of expanded version, which uh, John and Marcel are using, um, which basically says workers in the global south are paid below their subsistence wages. And this is an expanded bit. And the uh, surpluses that are generated, this extra surpluses that are generated by that uh, that extremely low payment of wages to workers in the global south, those are transferred in some way, shape or form to the global north. And uh, northern workers benefit to some extent from that through buying of cheap goods, for example. Okay, so that's the expanded version. But you know, John Bellamy Foster, in a very good article in Monthly Review, also points out that there's a more restricted version um, of super exploitation, which is just to say, just to say, you know, workers being paid below subsistence, their subsistence their subsistence requirements, which, you know, you have to define, and I'll come on to that later, hopefully. Um, so, you know, I agree. And in my work on global value chains, I agree uh, that uh, <clears throat> workers in the global south are super exploited. I agree that these are the huge processes of value capture by northern lead firms, northern transnational corporations. Um, so that takes place. Um, you know, there's, I also agree that some workers in the global north you know, middle class and managerial, but also workers probably uh, probably benefit from this. I mean, there's a very famous smile curve um, that uh, supposedly, um, you know, sort of bourgeois ideology supposedly explains the distribution of value in global value chains. And the smile curve is basically, you know, on the two top bits where the most value is produced, as it were, as they say, um, you know, you have things like design, finance, uh, and sale. Uh, and then the bottom bit, which doesn't produce anything according to bourgeois ideology, is a production in the global south. And uh, Zach Cope and others um, have just inverted that. And so, look, it's a misery curve. You know, the real bulk of the value is produced in the global south, and it's captured in the global north, which is what uh, John is saying, which is what Marcel is saying. And I totally endorse that. And I've written a paper on global poverty chains, which kind of tries to substantiate that a bit further and contribute to that discussion. Um, but, and this is where I raise a few questions. Um, 
you know, is this the key division between uh, northern and southern workers? Um, and secondly, do all northern workers benefit from this form of expanded super exploitation? Um, now, as, as you do, I was uh, browsing through volume through Capital the other day, and I saw this amazing quote from Marx. He's talking about the Corn Laws, and he's saying how the, a bit like Brexit today, the, the, the advocates, the Corn, uh, of the repealing of the Corn Laws in, the, in Britain, especially in England, um, before they were repealed, were saying, look, you know, we repeal them, the cost of um, corn and therefore bread will go down, and therefore, you know, we can shorten the working day. And then the minute they were repealed, uh, these same capitalists were saying, no, 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 we can't afford a 10-hour act. We need, to keep exp we need to keep making workers work for, for longer, you know. And it's the same kind of uh, mentality today, I think, in many ways. Okay, so in terms of, um, you know, global value chains, uh, I think it's, 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 you know, and it's not just Marxists like us who are recognizing that global value chains squeeze um, workers in the global south and uh, firms in the global south as well. So this is UNCTAD. Um, yeah, so UNCTAD 2018 report says the rise in the profits of the top TNCs accounted for more than two thirds of the decline in the global labor, labor income share between 1995 and 2015. Therefore, although the rising share of the profits of top TNCs has come at the expense of smaller enterprises, it has also been strongly correlated with the declining labor income share since the beginning of the new millennium, right? So UNCTAD is staffed by quite a few lefties. So you think, or I mean, lefties work in there, some of them. So you think, well, they might say that. What about the World Bank? Well, their recent World Development Report says, and I quote here, in 63 developed and developing economies, GVC integration, as well as other domestic within industry forces, such as technology or markups, contributed significantly to the reallocation of value added from labor to capital within countries between 1995 and 2011. So, you know, even the World Bank recognizes that there's some relationship between global value chains and kind of, you know, wealth capture and wealth uh, transfer. So, the concept of super exploitation is absolutely key to global value chain analysis, I think, to any, any realistic, you know, materialist, historical materialist analysis. And the idea of super exploitation obviously um, goes to, I mean, Marx has got, I think, a chapter somewhere in volume two or volume three, which is basically a paragraph on super exploitation. But, um, you know, it doesn't really talk about it that much. Marini did, uh, Andy Higginbottom has done, John Smith has done. Um, it's come back to life uh, for good reason, because it so obviously is there. And, you know, <clears throat> Marini was very clear about it as far as I understand it. He says, you know, how does Latin America compete with the rest of the world? Um, it does so by pushing wages below subsistence and exploiting their workers more than work, uh, capitalists in the global north. Okay, but, and again, I'm, I'm making a statement here, but I'm very, be very happy to be corrected because my knowledge of Marini is limited. But, you know, did Marini talk about the gendering aspects of super exploitation, the gendered aspects of super exploitation? And also, did he think about super exploitation in the global north. Um, obviously, his focus was Brazil and the global south and Latin America. Uh, but uh, was he thinking about it in the global north? I think <clears throat> we need to do both. We need to think about the gendered aspects of it. And we need to think about the uh, whether it's taking place in the global north, former first world. Now, of course, you have many examples of super exploitation taking place in the global south, former third world, what have you. I mean, you know, there's this great new book called uh, "Dying for a Dying for an iPhone" here, which um, I'm just reading now. It's really great. Um, you know, just looking at Foxconn and how they totally screw their workers beyond anything that we could imagine. So we all know about that. Um, but then, you know, there's also examples in the former Second World of <clears throat> lots of super exploitation taking place. I've done some research with colleagues who are in the clean clothes campaign working in Central and Eastern Europe, and they show, they look at the uh, footwear sector and the clothing sector, and they show, you know, these are mostly women employed. They show, and these are, these are firms producing uh, cut, make, and trim kind of activities. Uh, they import the garments, they, they cut them, put them back together, uh, and then export back to countries like Italy and Germany, uh, and they're sold like Prada or Dijkman or what have you under those labels, but uh, much of the labor is taking place in 
uh, Eastern Central Europe, and these women are paid well below subsistence uh, wages. And the, uh, it's not just the supplier firms who, who are guilty of that, the uh, local governments, the national governments of these uh, countries, um, you know, they have kind of sectoral uh, wage uh, determination strategies. And so they say, well, you know, these, these sectors, garments and footwear, they will receive the lowest wages. Um, you know, usually it's agriculture that does, but you know, in this case, it's the uh, these sectors here. Um, you know, the um, EU, when it expanded into uh, Eastern Europe as well, it says, you know, it, it cut quite a few of its uh, uh, requirements about kind of welfare and pay um, levels uh, that were that accrued to Western European workers uh, in order to incorporate uh, Eastern Europe as a kind of peripheral zone to kind of, you know, from so Eastern Europe went from being a periphery of the former USSR to being a periphery of the EU. And the, uh, the, the consequence for these women workers is pretty terrible in terms of uh, very low wages. They compensate that by working extra hours, <clears throat> by producing uh, food themselves in their own gardens as a kind of legacy of the uh, communist period. They have access to some access to land uh, through taking out loans, uh, through by going without a lot of essential items uh, and so on. Um, okay, so you got, you got exp super exploitation taking place in the former second world but the point of my paper i wanted to make is that uh, you know you have a i think you've got an expansion of super exploitation in the more limited sense uh, taking place in the first world in the global core in the uh, imperial center um you know uh in in this country um there's been uh, recent scandals of uh, boohoo the um uh, textile uh, the 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 you know seller of um, all kinds of garments um, in, in Leicester, uh, paying really substandard uh, wages, uh, sort of three pounds an hour, uh, forcing its workers to <clears throat> go to, to kind of claim benefits as well, um, to kind of top up their, 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 their wages, um, you know, not declaring wages, uh, using uh, migrant workers uh, from places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Eastern Europe, using these workers, uh, more, the most vulnerable migrant workers to ensure they've got these uh, kind of uh, labor pools, uh, highly exploitable labor pools, um, you know, cramming together in uh, substandard uh, accommodation in factories that, you know, really close together. And, you know, during the COVID crisis, uh, you know, is one of the reasons the scandal broke was not just the low pay, but because uh, there was a spike in COVID cases in Leicester, uh, the boohoo factories were seen as potentially uh, the, 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 the kind of route, the place where the explo re-explosion of COVID took place. And they found out, lo and behold, that, uh, you know, these factories were, you know, sweatshops. Um, so you, you have that kind of situation. Um, but beyond that, uh, you've also got in this country, in the United Kingdom, um, you've got um, um, a massive increase in a massive existence of and a massive increase of unpaid uh, labor. So, you know, uh, just to quote here, in the UK prior to the COVID, approximately 9.1 million people, mostly women, undertook unpaid care work for relatives. Since the onset of the pandemic, an additional 4.5 million people have become unpaid carers, of which a vast majority are women. You know, so that is a um, huge uh, number of the population. Uh, so, you know, Marx says, you know, a precondition of the existence of a labouring class for, that's there to sell its labour power to uh, capital is the reproduction of the labour force. Uh, and here we see it, you know, the unpaid care work that goes into that. Uh, so that is a major factor. I mean, you know, super exploitation, the concept is about uh, extremely low pay, sub uh, subsistence um, payment of sub below subsistence wages. But what about um, unpaid? work? Where does that fit into this concept of uh, super exploitation? Now, just to give another example of how this great country, this great nation, the UK, is uh, going, you know, the traject direction of travel. Uh, in 2018, a report, and I'm being sarcastic, by the way, in case you couldn't tell, uh, in 2018, a report by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation found that the number of workers in poverty in the UK was 4 million in 2017. That's one in eight workers are working poor. I mean, that's what, about 12, 13 percent? Um, a rise of 500,000 since 2012. So, you know, austerity is really pushing uh, numbers of working poor up. Uh, 4.1 million children lived in poverty in the UK. 
So, you know, out of a classroom of 30, that's nine children living in poverty. Um, uh, and, you know, you see that in terms of the rise of food bank use uh, and things like that. And then the report goes on, the workers in four types of industry have particularly high rates of poverty. Accommodation and food services, 25%. Agriculture, forestry and fishing, 30, 23%. Administrative and support services, 22%. And wholesale and retail, 18%. I mean, these are big, big, big figures. These are not marginal at all. Um, so they're quite significant. Um, where does that fit into our analysis of super exploitation and the imperial mode of living? Um, another example is the uh, farming sector in this country, as I've just mentioned, a large percentage workers experience poverty in farming. You know, during the COVID crisis, you had uh, the um, pick for Britain scheme where, uh, you know, the government was desperate and farmers were desperate, farm owners were desperate to get workers into the fields. And so they said, look, come and live with us. You can get over the social distancing uh, technicality by pretending that you're all one big family and so we can cram you together in these uh, makeshift accommodation and so you live together at risk to yourself through covid and also receiving very very low wages and i mean the um you know the the farming sector according to one study workers there receive two-thirds of the wages uh, on average compared to the rest of the economy however you calculate that uh, and people know about that and then you know i give more examples in there about um uh, kind of uh, all kinds of uh, terrible practices, you know, uh, big deductions for accommodation made by the owners of the accommodation, owners of the farms. And then, of course, in, in, in services, you've got the proliferation of Uber Eats, uh, Deliveroo, you know, this kind of um, online uh, kind of based uh, delivery systems. Uh, you know, these are workers being paid piece rates, waiting around. Um, so, you know, they, you know, they could earn uh, above a uh, subsistence wage during the day, uh, but often they suffer from underemployment and that they're waiting around and they're not actually getting paid for the time they're waiting around. So where does that fit in to our conception of uh, super exploitation? Um, okay, so they, they are just some examples, um, not at all meant to dismiss the IMOL conception, but just to, uh, you know, create some friction and some uh, more areas for, for investigation, perhaps. Um, so just in terms of a few uh, areas to think about in terms of um, what we can investigate, what we can research in this kind of stuff from this uh, eye model perspective is, you know, we can look at um, documenting cases of super exploitation across the global north. Um, you know, and then we can ask questions like, you know, how do these cases interact with uh, dynamics of unpaid care work? Um, Another way of looking at it is how do the process of super exploitation in the global north, how do they articulate with super exploitation on a world scale? Um, I'm not saying workers in the global north are more exploited or there's more super exploitation in the global north than the global south. No, I mean, the global south is where the bulk of super exploited workers are. But what is the relationship between them? My feeling is that uh, globalization has uh, generated intense competition, uh, cost competition between workers in the global north and the global south, uh, to the effect that uh, wages in the global north are falling because you have workers in competition with garment, you know, everyone knows about the Bangladesh Rana Plaza disaster, but then you've also got the uh, fast fashion based kind of uh, boohoo firms in Leicester, who are you know, a different a business model in a way, much faster turnaround delivery to uh, the uh, lead firm kind of uh, processes but also they're in competition with those workers in a uh, place like Bangladesh um, okay and then some other questions which I got um, you know this is a methodological question you know how conscious do we think northern workers are of these dynamics of relational inequality uh, what role does this play in their political formation outlook and what kind of research methods would we need to demonstrate these phenomena and their interconnections uh, does it matter if northern workers are only par partially or not at all conscious of their benefits from relational inequality uh, to what extent are northern workers uh, variegated or differentiated into groups who benefit more, less, or not at all from relational inequalities? Uh, you know, so do northern workers actually, are northern work, is the northern labouring class uh, subject to relational inequality of itself? So, you know, in the Boohoo case, uh, they produce dresses which you can buy for four pounds, okay? So obviously, you know, if you're a very poor worker earning very low wages, you're going to go and buy cheap stuff. What is that in terms of uh, relational inequality? Um, these are all kinds of questions uh, that uh, I think we can ask, and I'm hoping they would contribute to uh, the uh, IMOL um, perspective. Um, and 
um, that that's my contribution really uh, more kind of um, some some thoughts uh, rather than a fully worked out thesis uh, there so I'll leave it there thanks very much Ben th thanks a lot uh, for a uh, uh, wonderful paper very good paper interesting detailed paper which uh, you've written which also uh, gives um, a, 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 a lot of uh, reason to think about some of these issues. I want to start by thanking uh, Marcel and uh, uh, the crew for organizing this uh, important uh, uh, workshop or conference and also uh, including me. And it's a pity that uh, we have to meet in this mode because I'm not very technically uh, savvy uh, about these issues. Now, my uh, reading uh, or comments on uh, uh, Ben's work, uh, what I did is to ensure that I do not give a critique, but try to raise as many uh, questions as possible because I respect um, authors when they put so much energy uh, in producing uh, work like this. But the central issue normally is uh, uh, the unit of analysis, where we start, whether we start with the whole or the parts. And normally, if you start with the parts, like uh, a value chain or you start with uh, super exploitation, there's a tendency for people to add or question other parts which uh, you do not include. And that is not my approach. I think those who write these papers uh, want to give a certain point and therefore have to remain focused. So, I mean, in terms of unit of analysis, which will come back, whether you start with the whole world economy or whether you start with parts, which is including um, the uh, labor uh, issues in, involved. Uh, I summarized uh, his position uh, there and uh, he has also done so quite well. So I don't think I have to repeat that. Well, what I'll do is to see, uh, to the, go to the, what I said, the context, uh, the content, and then the methods, uh, which is, uh, I think, um, where much of the discussion uh, uh, center. With regard to the actual research itself, at the level of uh, description and Analysis, I have little to say. It is well uh, uh, stated and it's also convincing, but it is essentially when the, it comes to the level of explanation, when it is starting to cover areas which uh, at times seems to become uh, unconnected to the chain, that is where it becomes problematic. So the question is, uh, is the chain a circle or is the chain that is global value chain, is it a line or is it a circle? If it is a circle, uh, then you have to include a lot of things, including financial sector on, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, other uh, issues in it. But once uh, you focus on the global va value chain itself, then uh, comes the issue uh, as to what constitutes the capitalist enterprise or the difference between wage labor, organized labor, minimum wage of a given country. And all these issues uh, becomes problematic. And also the agency of the people uh, who sign contracts, whether there's any legal context in this whole issue of super exploitation and whether people are exploited only when they are at the wet floor or some things, more other things uh, 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 take place. So, so that is uh, problematic. So there are a lot of queries there, which uh, uh, those who looked at my paper will also find, and I think we can return to that uh, later on. And with regard to the issue of uh, um, Production itself, an issue of uh, poverty or uh, living wage or uh, 
subsistence, which that, that is quite um, uh, problematic in, in the sense that um, the, there are other factors, for example, in, in regard to production, where I say, okay, production for what? Because already there's enough food in the world to feed almost everyone. So do we need more production of food? But still we need to produce because those who produce food uh, do not give it free. And therefore, uh, others have to find a way of producing uh, food. Then comes the question whether the solution to the answer, uh, questions we are posing, the answers to the question lie in the north or lie in the south. If we talk in terms of global north or south, Take food production. If we say, for example, when the Berlin Wall, wall fell, uh, I was in conversation with a, a Dutch agronomist at uh, Wageningen, and he, when he said, Kwame, I think Africa would be in trouble because they're going to break the Lome Convention, because now that uh, the Berlin Wall has fallen, agricultural uh, production will be shifting to Eastern Europe. That they will put the attention to Europe, because Europe has already, Western Europe has reached 94% uh, of its agricultural uh, production capacity. But Africa has only 25% uh, production capacity. Now, what am I talking here about? So if Africa increases its food production by 100% to go to, let's say, 50% uh, of its production capacity, which means that many farms have to collapse in Europe and in the, in the United States where agriculture is being subsidized. So if we're going to deal with the ecological crisis where they are telling farmers to produce less, if Africa where the hunger is poverty is, if they increase their production, it will also affect global uh, relations, labor and, and, uh, and also food production and all those. It means that the Africans will also be able to feed themselves and there will no be dumping of food stuff from Europe or European Union to those countries. That means if you go into the discussions at this level, it means you have to bring other factors in, but we have to focus on the super exploitation. So these are some things that come to mind, but which I could not, I would not use as critique, but I think these are issues we should also take into account. Also, the notion of capitalists and the, uh, those who uh, invest in all these projects, we also have to uh, take into account how capital itself circulates uh, around the world, stock exchange and all this. Whom do these monies belong to, actually? Because the farmer or even the person who is setting up a factory uh, in Leicester that person has to borrow money from the bank. And the bank also has to borrow money from somewhere. So maybe if Saudi Arabia produces its oil and leaves it to the Western banks, then people can use the money as if it is their own money. But maybe it is not their money. But it's because the oil producing country have left the money in the West. They did not take it to their countries. Also, another example, and I'm careful uh, with freedom of speech, because I don't believe in blind freedom of speech, because you cannot say everything. But I remember when Libya was invaded in one of these European countries where we are sitting now, there was 30 billion of Libyan money, 30 billion uh, euros Libyan money in the, this country. And the minister announced that we are seizing that money until Libya becomes a uh, 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 normal functioning country before we release it. This is happening to many countries where their monies have been seized from Iran to Libya through uh, Iraq and all those because uh, there, there, there's war or something which has been also engineered from this part of the world. So if Sarkozy engineers war in Libya, seizes Libya's money, and then so-called capitalists are using this money to trade invest and all those things and give loans to other people, then where is the chain? Who is doing the exploitation? Is it the owner of the factory in Leicester 
who is the culprit of this super exploitation, or is it the financial system which has been created and which states are using to bully other states and all these things. So these are other factors when we talk about the chain, whether we look at the chain beyond the factory level, yeah? And also if we talk about exploitation and also uh, super exploitation and the comparison between poverty in the world, that also becomes problematic. It also can also become racialized because it is as if other people can uh, endure poverty more than others. Yeah, because the question is, are certain regions in the world supposed to be more poor than others? And that if you don't uh, earn enough in this part of the world, it should be a scandal because there is supposed to be no poverty here, but poverty can be something somewhere there. I give you an example during Thatcher's, Margaret Thatcher's period in, in Britain when in the, uh, uh, in the Montserrat, there was this volcano and the uh, uh, Windward Islands, uh, they, there was this crisis and they requested money uh, from the British government because Britain subsidizes those islands about 400 pounds per year per head, but they subsidize Falkland Island, 2,000 pounds per year. So this guy from the Caribbean Association went to negotiate uh, with the government to increase the subsidy for the Windward Islands. What he told him was that, what the minister told him is that, you know, you cannot compare Falkland with Windward Island because black people can accept poverty better than the white people. Yeah. So he said, is that what you are saying? Okay, tomorrow you should read the Times. I'm going to the Times to tell them right away that this is what you have told me. Yeah. He left the office and then by the time he got to the, his office, the minister was calling for him. When he got to the office, the people said, what have you done? The minister is calling for you. Have you done something wrong? He said, no, I told him this. He picked the phone and the minister said, I've increased it by 500 pounds. So come and collect it. Yeah, so this issue of super exploitation, poverty, and all those things are also uh, racialized in the sense that should northerners be uh, uh, less uh, poverty prone than others, or should there be a kind of equalization of poverty as time goes on? I mean, so. So I, I have to come finally to the issue of periodization, which is also the methodological side. Because as you read along, you realize still that one, one minute. So okay, please be brief. You, you realize thanks, Marcel. You realize that the concepts are being used, maybe have been used by other authors, different contexts, and all these things. So these all these things uh, ring bell. Bell. For example, I read and I say, oh, but is it not what? Uh, uh, Freud and uh, uh, Otto Kreyer were talking about back in the 70s about new international division of labor. Are we not in the same mold uh, here also? Because uh, uh, Wallerstein, uh, uh, Garifi makes reference to Wallerstein uh, on the, the value chain and all those things, but these are not made references in this paper uh, and others as if uh, nothing has come before. So the question is how far in history do we go in discussing the issues at hand? I rest my case. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kwame. Um, yes, so now we can start with the discussion and we already have two people who would like to say something. Well, one is Luisa Monteiro from Brazil. She doesn't want to pose the question herself, but Herman will impersonate her and read her question. And the next one then will be Andy in Higginbottom. Yeah. Uh, question is put in a question and answer. Um, you know, thanks for your ideas of a event organization. As a Brazilian, here my question. What role can original populations, as indigenous people, play in a world where class struggle? As they are living and want to keep their traditional way of living, 
but also acquiring at the same time contribution from the capitalist world, such as the institution school, healthcare for unknown diseases, iron tools, and airplanes to transport sick people. Capitalism makes a movement to destroy them and or to make them urban unskilled workers because there is need of land and minerals for capital development. How to perceive their struggle in addition to a humanitarian approach. Okay. And now we should give the floor to uh, Andy Higginbottom. Mm -hmm. Now I can see if I can do that. Andy, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay. You should be there now. Thank you. I mean, there are so many huge questions that uh, both Kwame and Ben have raised. Um, in my opinion, uh, the tendency towards super exploitation is inherent in the capitalist mode of production. Uh, in that sense, it should be seen alongside relative surplus value and absolute surplus value as being a, a core relationship of exploitation. And although Marx did not theorize this, uh, he pr provided the platform from which it can be theorized, which is the theory of surplus value. And he did give some examples of this. I mean, in particular, in chapter 10 of volume one, uh, women workers in the context of the battle for the 10 hour day, it also was the case that women workers were paid about two thirds as much as male workers. I mean, this is um, not theorized, it's not conceptualized as a different rate of surplus value, but that's what it was. Um, I do think that the, the notion of relational inequality is a very helpful one, um, but I also want to add that the gendered dimension of this has been raised before. It's not known, it's invisible, unfortunately, but let's make it visible. And Claudia Jones in particular, in the African uh, uh, Trinidad, actually Afro-Caribbean, who was in the United States, joined the tradition of African-American communism, which were actually the first to generate the idea of super exploitation. And they generated the idea because they were saying, look, we are oppressed. We are part of the working class, but don't forget our specific oppression and exploitation. And so the, the, the idea predates Marini. He gave it a systematic uh, conceptualization in the Latin American context. But the idea actually comes from oppressed workers or communists who were themselves oppressed. And this is a very important point. You cannot take the oppression out of super exploitation. It is an inherently violent, oppressive uh, category within the capitalist mode of production. And Marx made the simplifying assumption it, of exchange of equivalents, which actually took it out. And so we do have to sort of revisit Marx on that point. I mean, I think Ben raises very, very relevant points about the generation of super exploitation in sections of the working class in Britain. What Claudia Jones was actually pointing to was a division of the working class. And it wasn't only the working class, it was actually a division of the communist movement. She was saying, look, you white, uh, communists, look what you're doing to us. Uh, and so, you know, we have to look at it in the context of a relational context, okay? But there is something else as well I'd like to say. I mean, in terms of the Kwame's points about the transition uh, that Nkrumah named as neocolonialism, this was a controlled transition, often with violence again, in order to maintain the conditions of labour super exploitation. I mean, in other words, the a perspective of the working class in a neo-colonial situation is, is that the, the violence against them continued, but from a neo-colonial corrupt elite in, in most cases. And, and I think that Walt, Walter Rodney has already mentioned, I mean, he really did uh, give a more of a Marxist version of neo-colonialism than did Kwame Nkrumah, because he brings in this class relation in a neo-colonial state. My, my final point then is, is in relation to this. The, these are not only uh, country specific categories, right? They are absolutely general categories about the general relations of the capitalist mode of production. They obviously do have 
concrete and specific examples and forms. But uh, what Walter Rodney was writing about, what uh, Angela Davis has written about, what Claudia Jones has written about, are all to do with the fact that they are more oppressed. They're a more oppressed section of the working class. And what they did is theoretically articulate and express that positionality within the working class. And it, it, it is to them that we should uh, you know, look for further inspiration. Thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, the third question comes from uh, Kavi. So uh, I have three quick points. The first one would be maybe it would be interesting to juxtapose or compare unpaid work with commodified care work. And um, to complicate things, I mean, there is um, quite a lot of households where just one part of the household works and the other doesn't, mostly women, but women still have more money at their disposal than commodified care workers, right? So there's this tension, I think, which needs to be kind of at least mentioned. Second point, you, you mentioned Uber Eats, Uber Food and so forth. I just wanted to uh, raise your attention to one um, interesting aspect of this relationship, that there's a lot of um, app holders of Uber Eats and Uber Foods in France who then sublet their app to refugees, to non-citizens who work for half or one third of the money that the Uber Eats and Uber Foods drivers get. So maybe that relation is also interesting, super exploitation within super exploitation, right? I mean, the hierarchization of different uh, part segments of the labor force. And then the last aspect I wanted to raise is the whole question of agency and the role of the national slash comprador bourgeoisie. Because I mean, imperialism is of course important and it's one aspect, but if we leave out this whole um, national or comprador bourgeoisie and the agency involved within the so-called global south, then um, um, our strategies might be different because one thing is to tackle imperialism, the other thing is to support um, and strengthen the labor movements and the democratic forces in these countries so that a more a stronger um, degree of uh, um, a rule of law can be established and the workers' movement can actually fight for their, for their rights. So I think there is a, a struggle on two uh, fronts. One is an anti-imperialist struggle and the other one is, is, is a fight in order to strengthen uh, the, the labor movement. And unfortunately, a large segment of the left, of the radical left, is ignoring that. People from the New Left Review, Counterpunch, Junge Welt, they do not take seriously enough the struggle um, against despotic regimes, predatory regimes, and they kind of ally themselves uh, with uh, reactionary regimes such, such as Russia, Iran, China, and so forth. And then the, uh, uh, the ends justify the means and the enemies of the enemies becomes one, one's best friends. And this is very bad for the uh, labor movements within and for the democratic forces within the global south. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kavi. And then we have a final question from Virginia Higginbottom. Macfarian. Hmm? Macfarian. Oh, yeah. She was on the phone. Yeah. Will she pose the question herself? or I don't know. Well, I, I haven't received the answer yet. Okay. Well, then we continue with, with Ben. Ben, can you briefly because we still have eight minutes, uh, gives your response to the three questions or groups of questions posed. Yeah, uh, thanks very much oh, to, to all of you. Thanks very much, Kwame. I really enjoyed reading your paper as well. I'm going to use it in my um, my course uh, to decolonize a lot of the uh, stuff in the welfare state. Um, I really enjoyed listening to Andy. I learned a lot. I'd love to, I don't know, Andy, if you could point, you know, the... Um, the chats bit here. I don't know if you can mention the Claudia Jones paper. I'd love to read that. I didn't know that at all. Um, that'd be very handy. I really appreciate what you said there. Um, so in terms of what uh, Kwame said about uh, racializing poverty, absolutely. I mean, in, in my book, The Struggle for Development, I've got uh, half a chapter where I talk about the dollar a day poverty line formulated by the World Bank. And I said, you know, this is the new Orientalism. Uh, in the Said sense, you know, the northern working classes have relational poverty or relative poverty, relative poverty, and the uh, <clears throat> the workers in the global south have the kind of dollar a day, which is is not a dollar a day. It's 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 inadequate to even consider. It's not even not enough to buy food. It's inadequate to consider how much is necessary to survive on. It's a completely useless uh, level of uh, poverty analysis. Even if you put it up to five or ten dollars a day, it's still totally 
um, uh, unfit for purpose. So I totally take your point about the racialization of poverty, blaming the victims and so on. Absolutely. That's part of the imperial mode, imperial mode of analysis. In terms of imperialization, you mentioned New International Division of Labour, Wallerstein, Gareff in the 90s and so on. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to, I mean, what's happened with the GVC, a global value chain approach, is that it's become progressively uh mainstreamed from something from a marxist on kind of world, a world systems theory of commodity chain analysis to right up to now the world bank is using it as a 100 percent pro-developmental pro-capitalist way of thinking so you know the so i'm battling against the kind of most recent versions of it uh, but also at the same time trying to bring in aspects that perhaps wallerstein didn't uh consider uh, as well or, or in the same way that i would like to consider uh luisa montero talked about indigenous populations you know i mean again in my struggle for development i do talk about how the um uh, how our kind of progressive radical parties uh, must take on the question of not just protecting indigenous populations but actually learning from indigenous populations i mean this is one of the things about the imperial mode of living uh, argument that uh, we have uh, in internalized so many of the kind of hegemonic ideas about capitalism growth um what have you division between north and south etc um actually one of the ways to break out of that is through solidarity and one of the ways to break out of that is through learning from people who we have not uh, really been in contact with previously so indigenous populations uh, especially uh, are very important um i really like uh, kave's point um, i think the question about uber eats is uh, i didn't know about that that's uh, shocking but not surprising and i totally agree with your point about the comparable bourgeoisie i mean you know i overemphasize the role of the international institutions uh, and, and transnational corporations in creating these kind of uh, labor regimes but of course you know the chinese state massive uh, uh, con contributor to contemporary globalization with you know two three hundred million uh, foul, uh, strong laboring class on the uh, the, the, the seaboard uh, of China and, and, and similarly with other um, states, uh, Bangladeshi, Vietnamese, Cambodian, etc. Um, so they're absolutely part of the picture in my analysis um, and I totally agree with you. Uh, you can't leave them out otherwise, yeah, you've got a completely biased approach to uh, kind of capitalism. But um, thanks very much. Yeah. I'll leave it there. No, I just wanted to know what the uh, proponent proponents of the IMOL perspective thought of my arguments about um, kind of more nuanced kind of class differentiation approach to the prevalence of the IMOL yeah. mentality okay. within the global north and that kind of and the methodological points. I don't know if that if that was useful or I'm completely going off the rails. Whatever. I, just... I found it useful, but now Uli will say whether he also found it useful. And very briefly, Uli, please. Yeah, I Six was not words. sure. Sorry? Six words. Seven yes. Is also. I was not sure because you said we didn't have enough time. I think it fits perfectly. My um, um, point was that you re you are reading Ben um, the imperial mode of living concept very much through the eyes of um, Marcel, but as we said in the first session and also in our writings, um, we have we are very explicit about the fact that. Um, exploitation takes also north in the global south it's hierarchizing um, it's um, it's taking place elsewhere this exploitation but within the global north I, I, I when i read your paper and we don't have this uh, uh, global value chain perspective but it fits very very well for the final discussion i would um, already make the point that we should take up ben's point on the methodology is there a methodology or are there methodologies to investigate the imperial mode of living because you you just have these um, bullet points on one page but i think this is worse to to think through yeah. okay thank you uh, uli uh, so that concludes Close this time. session and now we have a brief break until 15 14. <laughs>